Okay, we're live. Good morning. Good morning. Here we are. Here we are. And um, Jerry, the air conditioning in room 14 doesn't work. <laughs> we just figured that out. I, I turned it on about an hour or so ago, and it's 90 degrees in here right now. So if we look cool, if I look cool, Jim always looks cool, but if I look cool, don't, don't you believe it. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. Because the air, I think, is cleaner in here than it is out there. And besides, you are cool and clean and happy, and, uh, and that's the way you ought to be. Lord, thanks so much that we can gather. In my thoughts, I can dream the days when we'll all be together. In sweet laughter, we will live without pain, without sin, without fear. A time will come again for grieving. That our time has slipped away And I know that day is brighter than this dream And I know that heaven's higher than my hopes And I know I can't think more than God can make and so I think of you If you send love to me In my thoughts I can dream the days When we'll embrace each other In sweet laughter We will live Without pain Without sin Without fear, a time will come again for grieving. Because our time has slipped away. And I know that day is brighter than this dream. And I know. I'm 
Lord, thank you that the promise is two or three. You're with us. And Lord, even when there's no one but myself or any one of those who are praying with me now, even when there's but one of us, we're never alone. But Lord, the great blessing of, of being with someone else is to know that we're with you in a special sense. The help that we can give and the help that we can receive from one another can be from and for you. We, we come closest to touching God when we learn how to help and touch one another. Lord, there's a mystery that we've barely begun to believe. But Lord, you are the meaning of life. The meaning became a man. The word became flesh. And Lord, you're with us now. And with us always. And as we go through pandemics and forest fires and bad air and whatever particular troubles are falling on the lives of those who are listening, you know what you're going to do. And you will work all things together for good, for you yourself are good. Lord, we trust you to care for our personal needs, our collective needs, this congregation and all those that are looking to you. May we have great hope again today. In Jesus' name, amen. What's, what's, oh, okay. Let me come a little closer. There. Do you feel like you've come closer? You look, well, at least the camera's come closer. Jerry, it's still hot in here. But <laughs> I told you, you didn't have to come. But I just want you, I just want you to stand outside for a little bit so that you can feel our, no, just joking. You know me. <laughs> Always joking. You know, as it, it may not look that bad right now. I didn't check. There's a, there's a um, map on the internet. Uh, it's called purpleair.com. Oh, boy. You can, you can get on that map, and you can see that we're about the worst in the world right now. At least it's it's real-time uh, readings of, of air quality index all over the world. And, it, you know, it may not look that bad out your out your backyard or if you can see your fence or see your neighbor or whatever. But, but once you get a little bit of, of scope at where you're supposed to be able to see a distance, man, it, at least when I was traveling across the valley this morning, um, I, I kept having the lyrics, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you know, purple haze all in my eyes, don't know if it's day or night. And then, then I thought, well, I shouldn't have Jimi Hendrix in my head. So then, of course, the, the uh, Peter, in the second chapter of Acts, where, where he said that the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon turned to blood before the, the great, and not terrible, the great and glorious day of the Lord. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and, and you know, this is it. This is the great and glorious day of the Lord, if you want it to be. 
I mean, it's the, again, the choice is yours. This is the day the Lord has made. I'm not blaming him for the bad air or whatever, but the, however great and glorious it is, it all comes down to um, calling on him. And not in a religious, uh, you know, mother may I sort of way, but just, I, I hope that our time together here with him in, in the Gospel of John will help you to see him more clearly. Anything that's truly apocalyptic is unveiling. It's not veiling, it's unveiling. It's the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever things get black, that's just the background, backdrop to see him the more brightly, the more clearly. And so looking to, to see him, that's what it's all about, except for, hold on one second. I had this terrible sense that my nose was running and you can't just stand there in front of a camera and, and uh, let it, yeah, when you could, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. So there, I, I, I feel free in regard to that. It's still hot in here, but, uh, but that's, that's okay. It, I'm grateful <laughs> to, to gather, the, you know, like, like I said in that, little, in that little email, here, there, or in the air, and, and right now the air is, is bad, but it's, it's a blessing to be able to, to get together. I was looking, uh, back during the Revolutionary War, I wasn't around then, but I, I read a lot of history, and, and on May 17th, uh, 1780, in, in New England, there was a day they called it the Dark Day. And uh, it, you, know, you can Google it and look into it, but it was a day during the Revolutionary War, and people, you know, very Protestant, heavy Protestant New England at that time, and, and you know, talk about the moon turning to blood and the sun getting dark. And in the middle of the morning, it started getting darker and darker, and the animals started doing what animals do when things are like, it's weird. And by, by noontime, they had to light candles just to do their regular business, and, uh, and it was dark like that, all, all afternoon, all night. And of course, they didn't have the, the they didn't have purpleweather.com, certainly. Didn't, <laughs> didn't have different means to say, what, what is going on? And, and talk about a come to Jesus moment. A, a lot of folks were certain this, this is the, the end. Um, and now, you know, speculation, what happened? It wasn't a, a solar eclipse, it wasn't a meteor, it wasn't different things. Uh, I guess the best guess, based on tree rings and looking at it, is that it was forest fires. It was a, a fire somewhere remote, so heavy, uh, and, and it was kind of a foggy inversion layer, kind of like what we're dealing with. But, um, you know, we, we, we may have better science, but I, I think that helps us have more, at least it helps me have more come to Jesus. To not in a superstitious way, but in a, in a reverential way, to, to say, okay, it's another dumb thing happening. But God's not to blame for these things. He's the one who helps us to get through these things, and that's certainly what John chapter 6 is about. That's what we're studying right now. Chapter 6, as we'll see, will help us see the fourth and the fifth signs. And, and the fourth sign is the feeding of the, of the 5,000. The fourth sign is all about food. But, but not like, oh, we're foodies, food. It's just bread. But, but food like fuel food. But what are we going to run on? You know, again, the, the, the previous chapter was can we run at all? Or, you know, the lame man is enabled to move. Not that you can move. What, what, what keeps you moving? What keeps you going? What are you going to feed on? And so that's the, that's the big picture, the, the, the theme to think about as we go through this section. And, uh, of course, Jesus, in talking to the devil of all people, when the devil was tempting him, Jesus said, you know, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so certainly, you know, we're looking at the scripture and, and hanging on everything that Jesus says, and, and that's important. So, so here as we move into John chapter 6, uh, it's a very familiar story. All four of the Gospels have it. Most every one of you goes, oh yeah, yeah, I know that one. Knock it off, you don't know. <laughs> that's the first challenge when something's familiar. The, the first challenge is, how am I going to see this afresh? So, Lord help us to, to see it afresh. And then secondly, we're in John's Gospel. John's not Matthew, and Matthew's not Mark, and all of that sort of stuff about, uh, let me get a little closer to you. I just want to come a little bit closer. There. Okay. Now I got the thumbs up again, because this is closeness. And it was a, was it a sound issue? Yeah. I can always get... I can yell if you like. No, okay, no, you know, you don't need to do that. Shh, calm down. It's hot in here, you know. Uh, but uh, back where was I? Oh, in, in John chapter 6, each of the gospel writers comes from their own perspective. 
And that's important. You know, it's not like, oh, you have four different stories. We can live the same life in the same house. We can be married or whatever, and we come up sometimes with different stories. Not because we want to, but because we're different people. And sometimes that can be painful. Sometimes that can lead to a, a, an argument over what really happened. But it's good to, to hear the story of, of each person. And in John's case, he's dealing with it differently than the others. And uh, so see it afresh. See it through John's perspective. That's going to be my goal. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. It says, after these things, after chapter 5, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias. So chapter 5 was in Jerusalem. Uh, now we're flying right up to the north again, back into Galilee. But clearly, John isn't concerned about chronological or, or geological, geographical uh, consistency or, or uh, context. He, he paints a series of pictures and sets them side by side because these complete pictures um, you know, you had, you had uh, Nicodemus, the, the super religious Jewish guy, and then you have the woman of Samaria, and all of these contrasts and pictures. And, and here with chapter 6, it, it, it builds on chapter 5, of course, but it's, it's um, John's is a picture book. And so getting the picture here in John chapter 6, it says that um, a great multitude was following Jesus. So Jesus had a following. And, and nowadays, you know, getting a following is, uh, is something, it can be a big ego booster, I've got a following. It can be a, a, a big business booster, uh, how large is our following? It's, um, you know, I've, I've been doing the laundry sometimes and, and just looking at Ajax detergent and you I look to see how much I ought to put in with my sweaty socks or whatever, and, and it says right there on, on the Ajax thing, uh, you can follow us on Facebook, which always makes me think, who wants to follow Ajax on, on Facebook? But it's, it's, a, it's a business deal. We've got a, we've got a, a following. And, and for us nowadays, maybe we can, um, especially the ego booster part, may, maybe we would think something differently than Jesus thought when he had a following. That may be like everything we talked about last week. You know, this whole idea of, of somehow a source of your self-worth. How big's your following? Just understand. In fact, go back. Click back on the message from last week. <laughs> and, and, and look at that. How empty that is. Jesus, Jesus didn't feel better about himself because now he has a following. Jesus is always concerned for his followers. He's always concerned for how are you guys doing? Not how good do I feel that you're following. But now that you're following, how are you doing? And really even the Greek word for for following that's used here uh, means quite literally on the same road. The, the context alone can tell you, are you are you behind on the same road and following after you? Are you side by side on the same road? Maybe you ran ahead on the same road. But you're on the same road. You're a companion in that sense. And so for those folks that were, that were companions of Jesus at this point, um, the, the important thing for me to see is, is Jesus always had compassion for his companions. His concern was always, you got enough to eat? How, how are you doing? Not how good do I feel to have so many of you, but in some cases, like this one, I have so many of you, how, how can I possibly help you? It's, it's always concern for the, for the followers, a sense of responsibility. And so uh, it says that a great multitude was following him, and it says specifically for this group, they were seeing the signs that he was performing on those who were sick. So that's different than some of the other groups that we've seen. And that's why, of course, this follows on chapter 5. There was a guy who was sick. Jesus had compassion. Uh, the religious folks were ticked off because Jesus did such a good thing on a bad day. It, it messed with their system. And, and you know, we, we looked at all of that. But, but this is a different group, a different mindset. These folks, they like the idea that Jesus is compassionate. Maybe some of them need healing. Maybe some of them have a friend or a family member or someone else at home or with them that needs healing. But because they see Jesus as a healer, they're on the same road. They, they want to be with him for, for that reason. Um, and it says in verse 3 that Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. That's a picture. And you see that throughout. Jesus up on a high place, sitting with his disciples, and 
I don't know, but I, I think that Jesus might have really liked those times. I know he loved the times when he went up by himself to realize he wasn't alone and, and talked to his father. You know, those times he clearly found refreshment in. But these scenes where he's sitting with his disciples, and here it doesn't even say, typically the way the, the teaching was done in that day is that the, the, the teacher sat down and all the people, like Jim right now, stood up to hear the teaching. That way, if you fall asleep while the teacher's teaching, then you, you fall on your face and everyone laughs at you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, we do it differently. Typically, the teacher stands up and the people, but, but here in this setting, it says that he sat with them, or they all sat together, or at least that's the picture in my mind. It doesn't say specifically, but it wouldn't surprise me at all that, that Jesus just spent time sitting with them. Not, not that their ideas were as good as his, but but his love for them was, was a mutual sort of thing. And, and, and they could sit down and they could have fellowship. And, and that's the picture of them, uh, in my mind, up there on the mountain where it says that he sat with his disciples. And, uh, and then another picture that comes into my mind, that's not just like, oh, they're all sitting together, is, is in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, because I think it's, you know, it's meant to put these two together. So Matthew 5, let me read it to you. It says, when he saw the multitudes... He went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, he sat down, his disciples came to him. So that's the typical thing. The teacher sits down, his disciples came, and then opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now you know where he's going, right? The next three chapters, that's the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus saw the multitude, went up, his disciples came to him, they sat down, and he began to teach, and, and of course... Uh, I don't know if, I, don't, I doubt that he was on Facebook, but and they didn't have an amphitheater. Well, they, maybe they did. Maybe the mountain was an amphitheater. But at any rate, uh, what he was saying to his seated disciples went, went out to the multitude. And I think that those two pictures are, are meant to, to be tied together, to, to, to complement. Don't, don't confuse the two, but to complement one another. Because in Matthew's gospel, this isn't the feeding of the 5,000. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Later on, he'll have the feeding of the 5,000 and, and, and 4,000 that John says nothing about. But I, I think in terms of meals, in terms of not bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, I, I think the Sermon on the Mount is the most profound, most satisfying, almost overwhelming meal that anyone has ever sat down to. If, if, if I had nothing else of the Bible, um, I, I would want to... To me, it's the core, it's the, it's the heart. And so, providing that meal and, and, and seated there on the mountain and, and the same sort of, a, as far as word pictures go, I think that's all intended, so I point it out. And then it says in chapter four, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. So, when, whenever John says something like that, you know, parchments and scrolls and writing materials and all of that was really, Precious. You don't just put in things just because you're, there's no filler. It's, it's, it's especially in John's gospel. Like I said before, it's like a treasure map or, or like a murder mystery. Um, and I, I, I like to watch the PBS, the different uh, Agatha Christie, the, the different ones that uh, uh, David Suchet, Inspector Poirot, and, and they, they lay these little things in there. And, and then at the end, you know, you get this speech of, and here's how I knew. And, and I love those kind of things, uh, but I always fall asleep. They're always a mystery to me because it's like, oh, I wake up at the end and he's laying it all out. What happened? What happened? And then next time, you know, I watch it, I try and stay awake again. And, and, uh, but yeah, that's a nice thing. Forever mysteries. But, but, I, but I know how they work, even if I don't remember who done it. I, I, I know that they're supposed to be little things, you know, just a small thing. And of course, with, with movies and stuff, you know, they'll usually linger the camera for a second. And, and you don't think it's, it's random. You shouldn't because, you know, they spend a lot of time. You know, not just Agatha Christie when she wrote the, the stories, but, but the, you know, at any rate, John's gospel, not, nothing is in there that's just like, when he says it's the Passover, it's to make us think about the fact that he said earlier there was a Passover, and later he's going to say the Passover again, and all three of those need to be uh, tied together. So, so the first one we already studied, but, but again, I'll read it for you. You go back to chapter 2, Jesus cleansed the temple, you know that story. John alone puts it at the beginning of his ministry. He, he cleans house, so to speak. And it says right after that, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, 
Many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he didn't need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And we've seen that a few times. I think last week we referenced it again. But it's not that Jesus didn't love them or like them or whatever. He just knew that especially that group of people who saw him as a, as a, a political savior. Here he's, he's at the capital, he's in Jerusalem, he's at the center of religious worship, he cleans house. And there are a lot of people that say, yee this, this place needs ref, reform. This place needs, you know, we need to deal with all the high-minded religious folks. We need to deal with the Romans for sure. And, and here's a guy with the power to clean house. They believed in his name. Not, not like the disciples of Jesus who sat down and, and tasted the goodness when he turned water to wine. It says they believed in him. These people believed in his name. And so that was at the Passover. That, that, was, that was one group. They saw him there in Jerusalem as a, a political savior, a political messiah. Uh, now you have a different group. This group is following him. And, and these, are, these are more the rustic people. These are the people in the north. These are the ones where most of his ministry happened. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke make it seem like all of his ministry happened uh, there in the north. John alone tells us about some of these things in, in Jerusalem. But at any rate, here we're, we're looking at, at this other group of people who are following him for different reasons, different mindset. The first group was like, here's a guy who can clean house. This, this group is like, this, here's a guy who can heal us. Heal me, heal my family, heal my friends. He can fix things in, in a different way. And, and clearly different mindsets. M maybe both of them wrong in different ways. <laughs> that needs to be understood because by the end of chapter 6, they, they grumble and walk away. But, but they, they each had a little different agenda. The, the group in Jerusalem saw him as a, as a cleansing, reformation messiah. The, the group here that we're looking at that he feeds, they saw him as a, as a healing, give us the food of life, social savior. One maybe a more a political savior, this other saving society, feed us, give us the basic needs, the basic bread of life. Later they want to make him king because he can do that. So, so we're dealing with different groups. These two Passovers that John talks about, and then the third Passover, you guys know what it is. Jesus is the Passover. Later on, the cross of Jesus, the Passion Week, John says three times, just, you know, not three times, in case you, it's the Passover, it's the Passover, it's the Passover. He, he uh, makes it clear. And so these first two are, are kind of like the set the stage for the, the culmination one. The Jesus is the Passover, but here you get these two groups, um, one of them believing that Jesus can deliver them out of political bondage, the others believing he can provide bread and out of social needs. Each of them wrong in their own way. He's more than that, way, way more than that. But, but this whole idea of, of the Passover, it's not our tradition, at least unless you're a Jew who's been brought up in terms of keeping the Passover, but it was the, it was the tradition of Jesus and all of his disciples and all the people he's dealing with at that time. Passover was central to, to everything, kind of like our Christmas, but maybe, maybe even more. It was the central thing that, um, and of course we all know enough about it to know that, that it, it was a celebration of, of deliverance, deliverance out of political bondage, <laughs> get out of Egypt, and then be free. We're on our own now. Now we don't have those stinking Egyptians that keep us down now. <laughs> you know the story. But we're free now. We're going we're gonna to go. And it was also a deliverance out of death or through death. There's pictures about going through the waters, out of death, through death, and into life. And so it was, it was healing on the grandest scale. It was, it was a, a deliverance of, of health and life and vitality. So the Passover was all of that. These two different groups are seeing him somewhat. But we're still learning, hopefully, what, what the Passover really means, what Jesus really came to do, what he's doing every day. What, what can make this a, a great and glorious day? If, if we'll hope in him, if we'll, if we'll believe in him. And that, of course, is always our, our, our focus because these, these are not just historical stories. They, they help me every day. This is my medicine chest. It says, verse 5, that Jesus, therefore, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a great multitude was coming to him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? 
And this Jesus was saying to test Philip. For Jesus himself knew what he was intending to do. It's still hot in here. <laughs> but that's not the reason why I'm going to stop there, at least in terms of numbers of verses. <laughs> There's so much there. <clears throat> Jesus was testing him. I, I'm not in Philip's sandals or heart or head. But sometimes that whole idea, why? Why do you do that, Lord? Why do, why do you test? Especially for any of you, if you're in a really painful circumstance, if you're in a terrible situation, if, if just incomprehensible things are happening that seem so cruel and so random and so and then this whole idea well God's just testing you God's just, just testing you and then we get to this section and it clearly says that Jesus gentle Jesus the one who turns water to wine knew what he was going to do but he was testing Philip and and that's where I have to encourage you folks don't get it all confused you know, some folks think they got to figure it out because they, they, they got a system that, that puts it all together. And they're wrong. Their system's wrong. Jesus is a mystery. Love is a mystery. Life is a mystery. It's good. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. And don't confuse one story with another. In terms of this one, I mean, we're just dealing with this one. And it's pretty easy in John's Gospel to see Jesus is good. Jesus is kind. But, but clearly, it does say he's testing Philip here. And, and I would ask you, first of all, to remember the book of Job. It's maybe the oldest book in the Bible in terms of when it was written. It has that, that sense of being ancient. And remember the book of Job. It's a long one, but I can summarize it simply with this. If somebody is suffering and going through painful circumstances, keep your mouth shut. If you can remember that, I think you've, you've got the main gist of the, of the book of Job. Just... Sit with them if you, if you can, if you will. But, but quit with all of your explanations. And then secondly, and more to the context of John, I would remind you of the first sign. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Without being coerced, without anyone even believing it was possible, he turned the water to wine just to celebrate love and family and feast. And, and so just keep the first sign sign always first you know early, earlier this week uh, I saw one of my sons you know and, and he, he asked me how things going pop and he asked me the wrong question if he had said how are you doing then after last week's message I was all prepped to say I'm doing good but he didn't ask me how I'm doing he asked me how are things going and not that any, this last week was a terrible week for me by any means. It's just life has its... And so, you know, it was just an in-passing sort of thing. How's it going? But the, the answer I gave to him, I think it was a good one. That's why I'm telling you. It was one word. I winked and I said, challenging. Life is challenging. You know, it's a, it's, it's a good thing if you want to grow. Remember the whole context of the lame guy. Do, do you wish to be well? Yeah, I do want to be well. Okay. Then there's a certain amount of rehab that's involved, and, and, and it's challenging. And that's, that's, that's life. But, but please, taste and see the Lord is good. God is good. Life is a challenge. And then there are a lot of random, crazy things that can be cruel. And those who think that they can give an explanation for those random crazy things in Jesus' name or whatever pious position they want to take, those people are being cruel as well. They don't mean to be cruel. They, maybe they can't help it. They just think they know. Let me tell you. But you don't have to listen. You don't have to take it to heart. You don't have to let that keep hurting you. Because there are just, there are random, crazy, cruel things in this world. There, there just is. But God is not cruel. He's never cruel. When God tests you, it's never like a, a science experiment from a junior high kid, you know, the, the kid next door, the one in Toy Story, Sid, you know. 
<laughs> Let me see how long his leg twitches if I pull out the other one. You know? God does never, he doesn't, he doesn't tempt, he doesn't test towards sin or to the things that would lead us to that loss. He, he's just not that way. But, you know, th there are countless crazy things that I can't understand, so I'm not going to waste any time trying to talk about even one or two of those. There, there's a bunch of them. Let me just say a, a few things as we go through Scripture, things that I can say for certain. Things like I've already said. God is good. And, and those who hope in Him won't be disappointed. And, and then I'll remind you, a lot of you folks are retired teachers or teachers that are just tired teachers, but, but you know that good teaching and good testing, they go together. It's just part of good teaching, is good testing. Not testing to make someone fail or feel stupid. Or good testing and good teaching go together. And, and you know, if, if Jesus is proving Philip, it's only to, to approve Philip. It's, it's, again, not getting our approval from man, but getting your approval from God because you've gone through some proving and you've, you've learned something. It's, it's the attaboys, but not attaboys from people on Facebook who attaboy you. I mean, that's fine, you know, but... The best things and the worst things about you are known by God. And he gives you the attaboys because he'll forgive you for the worst and he'll attaboy even the littlest thing that is meant for good. And so it's important that we get those things from him. And I, and I know for myself as a physical therapist, you know, when, a, when people are in rehab, there's a lot of rehab tests that we apply. And it's part of the rehab. It's, 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 it's never, you know, to cause pain. But, that you might not agree, especially if you're going through shoulder rehab or something. It's not like, you know, let's, let's see how much this hurts, you know. Ah, ah. It's, it's, it's to see, are we improving? What can we work on? It's, it's never to make you fall, never make you look stupid, never so that uh, the therapist can get together at the multidisciplinary team meeting and say, well, you wouldn't believe how lame this guy is. He fell down. It's, it, now, you know that's nonsense. But sometimes we, we, we think nonsensical things as though they happen in heaven, as though as though God tests to, to inflict pain or to... And, and of course, we experience pain, and he wants to help us. And of course, we, we feel stupid. But he's never going to say you are. We feel lame, and, but we ought to feel forgiven. And, and I hope you feel loved. I hope you understand, just like chapter 5, don't, don't leave the house of mercy. That's who Jesus is, that heart of mercy. And so here, this test, what, what, what's this test about? You know, again, read the red letters. Jesus said specifically, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? Now, my first thought, if I were there and Jesus said, Bruce, where are we going to buy bread that these may eat? My first thought, I don't think I'd tell him, but he'd know anyway. <laughs> my first thought would be, who cares where, where they eat? That's their problem. Are we going to create some sort of nanny state here? You know, these people, are they going to take some responsibility for themselves? Couldn't they see they were heading out into a lonely place and the last In-N-Out burger was way back then? Couldn't they have packed lunches? Couldn't they have taken care of themselves? Why should I care? Why? Okay. But even if I start to go down that road and I really want an answer for that question, who cares? You know the answer. The answer is Jesus cares. How do I know Jesus cares? Because he's saying... Where are we going to do it? <laughs> Dang. <laughs> if Jesus cares, then I'm supposed to care. And sometimes that's hard. But that's what it's all about. If Jesus cares, what's wrong with me? Why don't I care? If Jesus cares, I'm supposed to care. And maybe it just starts with honestly saying, Lord, you care, I don't care, help me to care. But, but, but that's the thing. And, and, and once you have a care laid on your heart by the Lord, that, that's the operative word, at least for me here this morning. Something that's laid on your heart. That, that's where testing happens. It doesn't happen until something is laid on your heart by God. All of us have dreams and ambitions and hopes for our business and hopes for our future. And all of us, you know, have things that they may be good. It's, it is good to, to plan and dream and, and, and hope that this works out and that works out. And whether they're pipe dreams or whether they're seriously thought out plans for the future. I mean, how many organizations had their 2020 vision and all the things that was going to happen this year? And Just because something no one expected to happen, except maybe Dr. Fauci, he's always been expecting this. Because <laughs> he knew it was inevitable. It's not out of the blue. It's out, it's, 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 it, these things are going to happen from time to time. Anyway, I, I diverge. 
that dream, have your visions, have your goals, have your aspirations, uh, have your five-year plan. You guys know about my four-year plan. You can do all of that. But when those things get challenged, that's just a challenge. That's not a test from God. And, 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 and just because you want something doesn't mean you have a promise it's supposed to happen. Maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe it shouldn't happen. Maybe you wouldn't be nearly as happy as you think you would if it did happen. I don't know. None of us know about all of that sort of stuff. But, uh, but that's just something that's, that's on your mind and on your heart, but it hasn't been laid on your heart. When something is laid on your heart, that, that may happen in a dream, a daydream, a nightdream. It, it may be like, the Lord just laid it on my heart. In all the years I've been around, and I've been around a while, and all the people I've heard, God just laid this on my heart. Quite frankly, at this point, I already don't believe you. <laughs> I know I shouldn't do that, but I've just heard that. We put these pious spins on what we want all the time. It just, I wish we'd stop that. Just say, you know, I'd really like to do this, or I feel this would be a good thing, or what do you think? Can we work on this together, or whatever? But we, we, tend, to, we tend to say, the Lord just laid this on my heart. Okay, fine. But the fact is, I'll guarantee you, if you're learning to love, love will lay a lot of things on your heart. Simply because you love. Love can be heavy. And only love can carry the heaviness of love. And I guess that's part of the message as well. It just dawned on me. What happens in the heart has to stay in the heart, so to speak. You, the head can't handle it. I just thought of that. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I always can say way more <laughs> than what I can do, but God help me, I'm learning. When love lays something on your heart, and it may happen when you first have kids, and it's like, it's laid on my heart to care for them, and to see them, suddenly things that weren't all that important. We need to get a church, we need to get food, we need to get, I need to get serious about my life, because the Lord laid something on my heart. I've got these kids, I've got responsibility, I've got friends, I, I, I've got people who, who are suffering, people who Maybe like the people in this crowd, some, somebody who's, who's hurting. And, and it's not just laid on my heart that I want to be healed. Even more, it's on my heart. I want them to be healed. I, I think of those four guys that, that carried that one fella and broke through the roof. And it says Jesus saw their faith. They're just, they were hurting for someone else. There was something heavy laid on their heart, and they believed that Jesus could do something. But how, how, do, how do you make that happen? And the, the answer is you can't. You can't make it happen. But just to know when, when love lays something on your heart and then it starts to run through your head, that's what I see happening here in regard to Philip. And I can relate to this so much. Something's laid on your heart and then it starts to run through your head. How are we going to make this work? And then what starts to just be tossed around in the mind becomes a grind in the mind, and the gears keep going and going and going, and it, it can't be solved there. Mm -hmm. you got to let it go there. But you don't have to let it go here, in, in, in the heart. You, you, you look at what Jesus said, where? First of all, where's the source, the marketplace? Where? Where are we to buy you know, bread and eat? Put those aside. The, the main operative things that become my problems is, is where. Where where are we going to accomplish this thing that's laid on your heart right now? Because I care about it, Philip, so now you're starting to care. Where are we going to do it? And by the way, we'll get back to it next week, but this was an all-day thing. It's, he seems to have said it right at the beginning. And I, and I know, man, I can mull things over for days and weeks and months and may, maybe a lifetime. And one day I'll see that whatever the Lord has laid on my heart, it will find a fulfillment. It has to. Somehow. Somewhere. But, but this whole thing of all day long things, first of all, the source. Where is it going to come to? And then the second word, to, to buy bread. Obviously, Jesus isn't going to steal it or <laughs> hijack it. It's going to be bought, but, but that's the means. Jesus didn't say anything about money, but Philip immediately went there and did the calculations, and who can blame him? You, you, when you're talking about the means to make something happen, I always go to money. Where is it going to happen, and how is it going to happen? And you, you look to money, and money can't do it. And so this grinding goes on in the, in the head. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. But it doesn't have to. God help us. It doesn't have to. That's, that's the test, not because God wants us to, to be miserable. He wants us to, to 
read these stories and, and rejoice and know that he does know what he's going to do. But I've got this heavy heart burden. How, how can a load that's laid on my heart be carried in my head? Ultimately, it can't be. I mean, many, many people have something on their heart, and maybe it's laid on them by God, and they do figure out an answer, but that's, that's great. That's great. Keep, keep trying. But at some point, when you find that it's just wearing you down to even think about it, and all your calculations keep coming up empty, don't, don't lose hope. Certainly, don't, don't lose heart. It's good to plan. I think I'm a planner. I'm a manager. I try to manage myself. I, I have a problem. I, I want to fix it. I want to find a way to fix it. Someone I love has a problem. Let's figure out what we can, what we can do about it. Yes, let's pray. But already, I'm having a hard time praying because I'm trying to figure out how, how can we do this thing for my kids, for anyone. I, you know, I, I know some folks can just not have a clue where, where the next meal will come from, and they'll just be happy-go-lucky. That ain't me. <laughs> I'm just not wired that way. I'm wired to worry. <laughs> and yet Jesus said, it's a waste. And I agree. What, what a waste. You, you, obviously, where? Where? There's no where in this one. But it's in my mind so often. And, and money. Buy. How? So at some point, you just got to let it go in your head. And maybe repeatedly, like me, oh, keep letting it go, keep letting it go, keep letting it go. But hold on to it in your heart. Because you, you, you all know, it's still hot in here, that um, you know what happened. We still don't know how it happened. We know that Jesus managed to do something. I don't want to be managed to do it, he just did something. And no one almost like the water turned to wine. No one saw. It, was, it wasn't sleight of hand. It wasn't a magic trick. But somehow, he took care of it. And Philip got to be a part of it. This thing that he cared about accomplishing. And Philip never, even after he'd seen it, like a lot of that, I, I, I saw it with my own eyes. I still don't know how it happened. I still couldn't answer the where because the where was like out of thin air. And yet it was in his hands. I, saw it last, I last saw it in his hands and it left his hands and went into my hands. But, but in other words, Jesus wasn't testing to see, you know, like, go, go figure, Phil. You, you can't. That's the whole point to me. Is you could never have figured this out. And then there are other problems we have, even when later he does it for 4,000. Those are Gentiles and suddenly we think, he'll do it for Jews, he won't do it for Jews. And then later on, they worry about bread just for the 12 of them because it doesn't. We got heart problems. <laughs> and no matter how many things we've seen with our eyes and, and maybe finally figured out with our head, we're still going to fall at the heart level until we lean on him. Lean on him. Lean on him. Jesus wasn't expecting Phil to figure it out. It's impossible. I believe he's telling me, quit, quit, quit trying to figure it out. It's on your heart. It's on your heart. You, you try to figure it out. There's no where that can fit the need. There's no amount of money that can make it happen. Certainly not in your control. But hold on to it in your heart. And uh, just let go in your head. Those are the two problems. Where is it going to come from? And where are we going to get the money? The, the market and the means. But there's a third thing. Bread and eating, I, I, like I said, I set those aside. There's a third thing that Jesus said that, that the first two are the problem. Here's the answer. Let's look at it again. Where are we to buy bread? Did you hear that? We. Where are we to buy bread? Talk about a little clue that maybe Inspector Poirot could have seen. Lord, help me to see that clue. We're in this together. We. Where are we? That's, that's where your heart is and locks onto. I gotta let go with my head. I don't know the market. I don't know the means. But in my heart, it's a we, it's a we, it's a we, 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 we. We, we, we. Like a little pig. <laughs> Can't you do what your little toe does? We, we, we. All the way home. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
in my father's house, your home. There's lots of places to live. And I'm preparing a place for you. I'm preparing you for that place. Lord, I believe you. Help my unbelief. I'm not alone. You're not alone. If something's laid on your heart from the Lord, if love is teaching you something, love can handle it. Don't be discouraged. Heavenly Father, help us to hear with our heart. And let go with our head. Thank you, Lord, for planners. Thank you, Lord, for people gifted in budgets and accounting and making things work. It's wonderful. Like, like the, the science that we benefit so much from, all the administrative skills, all of the good governmental skills, all of those things, I thank you for all of that. But at some point, we're all going to see that there are things that are laid on our heart that are too big for, for anyone but you. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be enlarged to have those kind of huge things on our heart. And, and yes, Lord, I do pray that people would keep planning and working and talking and studying and investigating and trying to look for solutions. But I pray that all those who do so would do so with a, with a hopeful heart. So often, Lord, you, you know, as, as you alone can know, how my gears grind. And, uh, and I've learned, help me to keep learning, that when I let go and trust you, it's a great and glorious day. There are beautiful things happening all around us. Help us, Lord, to look to those, to see those. In Jesus' name. I've got no closing song, but if you're watching this on whatever, you must be because there's someone here, but you, you can always click back to that. Because if I were going to sing a song right now, I'd go right back to that. I surrender. I surrender. I'm with you, Jesus. God bless you guys. Maybe in the courtyard next week, uh, hopefully.